in the first hour of the show this morning and uh, about these migration numbers. That I just keep shaking my head when I look at this stuff. And I know uh, my next guest is, I'm pretty sure he's of the same opinion as me. And I, I want to welcome him in now to comment on this. And it's the Leith Van Onselen. He's um, the unconventional economist and he is also the founder of Macro Business. G'day, mate. How are you? Yeah, g'day, Bill. Thanks for having me on again. Uh, it's nice to talk with you. I don't know if it's just me, but it's beggar's belief to me. I reckon this federal government is just leading us into poverty. I, I fair think do because I don't know how we sustain these migration numbers when I read the, this latest in record intake for January. Is it, is it as simple as why are we opening the floodgates when we, when we don't have the homes here or the capacity or the planning to even build accommodation to, 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 to um, take with the load, take all that load up? Yeah, I think you're 100% spot on, Bill. I mean, you know, every Australian should be asking the Albanese government now, why are you importing record numbers of people without a plan to house them and provide infrastructure for them? Because anyone who lives in Brisbane just needs to look around at your local parks. You've got tent cities sprouting up everywhere. And, uh, you know, it's a similar situation across Australia. It's just absolutely bananas that we're importing renters uh, a lot faster than we can build houses for those renters. And as a result, the rental vacancy rate has collapsed to an all-time low nationally. It's an all-time low in Brisbane. Brisbane's is actually worse than the national average. So a new data released today by PropTrack showed that Brisbane's rental vacancy rate was 0.95% in February, which is below the capital city average of 1.03%. And, you know, just to put some numbers around it, Bill, if you don't mind, um, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, Queensland added 32,000 homes to your housing stock last financial year. So this is 2022-2023 against a population increase of 138,000. Now, that means that only one new home was built for every 4.3 new residents. And that there is the reason why your rental vacancy rate has collapsed and why rents are going through the roof and why people have been forced to live in, you know, on the streets or in tents, in group housing and under severe financial strain. It's just, it is maddening. And this isn't just happening in Brisbane, this is happening across the country. So, you know, Really, the federal government is responsible for this. Uh, it, it, this is a rental crisis delivered to you by the federal government. Yeah, and that's what I—that's what makes me so annoyed because up here we've got, you, you may not uh, be aware of it, that we had a, a pink and bar facility which was set up during COVID. It was supposed to be a, co- a quarantine centre. Never got used. 500 beds in that. And there's been nearly a year of debate and talk about repurposing it so we can get people out of tents. We spoke to a bloke yesterday that he works a full-time job for the NDIS and he's, it's become another full-time job at night where he sources tents for people. And we've got this bloody pink and bar facility with 500 beds in it and there's a picture of the two state and federal housing ministers walking, laughing with each other there yesterday, blaming each other as to why this pink and bar facility hasn't been repurposed so we can get people out of the tents and just put a roof over their head and put a comfortable bed underneath their backsides. Yeah, unfortunately, look, you know, we, we, we have a failure of government uh, in this country. And, you know, it's not just the federal government, it's the state governments as well. Although I do slate most of the blame on this on the federal government because they obviously control migration. They love big Australian migration because it juices the federal budget. So the, the federal government collects about 80% of the tax revenue. The states collect and the local governments collect about 20%. And what that means is that the federal government basically gets all the gains from immigration. So they bring in, you know, record numbers of people. You have more taxpayers paying income tax. The federal budget loves it. Problem is all those costs are then shunted onto the state government because the state governments are the ones that have to provide most of the infrastructure, uh, most of the public housing. They've got to provide the hospitals, the schools, all that sort of stuff. And as a result, we end up going without because they can't afford it or they end up privatising everything to try and get some money in the door quickly. And then we end up with these ridiculously expensive infrastructure projects that are often public-private partnerships that are built by, you know, private toll road operators. So we... so. Basically, what it means is that now if you want to drive around, you've got to pay a toll when previously you didn't have to just because they've had to build this stuff to keep up with the manic population growth from the federal government. So, look, the whole thing's bananas. And and and, the, and one of the reasons for it is because we have this uh, – the, the incentives aren't aligned. So mm. The federal government gets all the benefits. We wear the costs and so do the state governments. And as a result, they just keep doing it. Yeah, I'll play you because we've got the news polling out today as well because we've got a state election, as you'd be aware, later in the year up here and the Labor government's on the nose here and it shows that the LNP, the Crucifully government up here, um, are going to are on track for a landslide win. And I, he was asked this morning, I think it was on Sky, the David Crucifully, the leader, about what his thoughts are on migration in this state. I wanted to get your opinion on, on what he said about it. I would say a massive pressure 
point on housing is the fact that we've had bad state governments that haven't planned for growth. And I don't fear a growing society. Growth enables your kids to have a job and for you to have a future. Mm. I don't fear growth. I fear really bad state governments that don't plan for it. And when I see them cramming people into areas and they don't put the infrastructure ahead of the game, and I'm talking about social, I'm talking about yeah. health, I'm talking about infrastructure, that's the issue. Yep. So what did you make of that? And for that reason, that it hasn't been planned for, shouldn't the brakes be put on immediately? Yeah, look, my, my, my view on that is it's a Muppet comment. He, he's, he's talking out his backside. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, as I said, this, the federal government collects the lion's share of the tax revenue from immigration. The states are left wearing the cost. They cannot afford it, which is why you never get enough of this stuff that he's talking about. And, you know, to your point, yes, absolutely, the federal government should, should, uh, should push the brakes, should pump the brakes. And, you know... You don't have to go too far back. I mean, if we go back to the turn of the century at around 2000, our immigration program was about 100,000 then. Mm. Uh, and Australia was just fine. Like, I'd argue that, you know, a place like Sydney or, you know, Australia in general was better during the time of the Sydney Olympics than it is now. So his whole thing about, yeah, oh, we're stealing from a kid's future, that's rubbish. We already have stolen from their future because we're giving them a basically unaffordable housing, now forcing them to live in, you know, high-rise dog boxes instead of houses, and I'd argue that quality of life is a lot worse now and less secure than it was 20 years ago when we didn't do this madness. Mm, yeah, oh, they're, they're just, we're getting failed at every level. I, I just, uh, it's really frustrating. It really is. Uh, anyway, we could talk about this for ages. I could tell you're frustrated as well. We uh, heard that the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, he gave a bit of a, uh, had a bit of a chat, I think it was yesterday, to give us um, a bit of pre-budget guidance. What did you make of that? What came out of his, uh, his wise mouth? Oh, yeah, just the usual waffle, mate. I mean, look, you know, the, the, the federal budget is facing a bit of a problem. So, so obviously, you know, it's had this windfall tax revenue from this from this mining boom that we've, you know, this commodity price boom that we've had recently, and that, that is waning, and it's going to wane. Um, so, you know, we're sort of, the, the federal government, again, it's another case of them reaping the benefits where we bear the costs. So the whole Russia-Ukraine war did deliver some more tax revenue for the federal budget, but we're not paying through the nose for our energy, so we're worse off. And that is starting to wane, so they're going to lose money there. And also, you know, again, this massive record population growth we've had through immigration has juiced the federal budget because they've had all these extra personal income tax receipts and also we've had massive bracket creep. So everyone's tax bills have gone up because we've been dragged into higher tax brackets because of inflation. And all that stuff's, you know, sort of temporary, mm -hmm. um, you know, to a degree. So, you know, look, looking ahead, the federal budget's going to be in a worse position than it has been the last, last you know, uh, year or so. So, um, yeah, look, you know, it, it's just more of the same from Smiling Jim. Just, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm not just having a go at him. There's yeah, yeah. In general, I mean, we just heard your opposition leader, you know, just spout a whole bunch of rubbish. You know, a word salad. Yeah, this is pretty much what. And I wanted to get your the... opinion on that because this is the bloke that's going to be probably leading the state for the next four years. And I'm thinking, well, where, where are you going to turn the, where are you going to turn a sod and turn the dial and change things, mate? And he, and I didn't get any optimism out of that at all. No, no, and the problem with it is, you know, our, our political leaders, both sides, all sides actually, the, I'd say the Greens as well. The Greens are big Australia as well. They love it. Mm. Um, you know, they're all they're all got their own their own uh, vested interests who are, who are working behind the scenes. So the coalition, you know, works for big business, big property. So does Labor. Yeah. And um, and and they obviously love big migration because easy easy cheap way to grow. There's nothing better for a Harvey Norman to grow than just to grow the population, and they they end up you know selling more stuff. Um, same with property developers, banks, everything. So they all push big Australia, and this is why they're, they're basically the puppet masters for our politicians. Mm, yeah, OK. Uh, what about the GST? I know during the week the, the GST pool, I think, estimated to grow from around $85 billion last financial year to $89 billion, but uh, the, the states are barely aching about um, the, the, the split up. Queensland, I think, were saying they're going to receive $469 million less, and New South Wales, $310 million less. What, what's your take on all of that? Well, I'm a Victorian, and Victoria's basically hit the jackpot, and I think it's unfair, basically, especially for New South Wales, because obviously, you know, the majority of the migration is coming to uh, New South Wales and Victoria, and I think the federal government should have to pay for that, because if they're going to bring them in, they need to provide us with money. But, you know, I don't see why New South Wales are getting dotted. But the, but the broader point here, here, Bill, is that, you know, the GST is a shrinking t revenue base. So because it excludes a whole lot of stuff that is the fastest growing component of expenditure, like healthcare and food, et cetera, it does shrink in relative terms over time. So basically the states are fighting over a diminishing pie. Mm. And, um, yeah, again, it's another case where the, the fastest growing aspect of tax revenue is personal income taxes, which are growing massively because of bracket creep. The federal government gets that, and the states end up with GST shrinking in a relative sense. 
So the state's revenue basis is shrinking. Yet at the same time, the federal government's piling in more and more people into the states and the states have got to pay for it. So, you know, we, we really need uh, some some sort of broad-based tax reform that shifts the basis, um, you know. Are we, we ever going to get that? Because we just seem to be getting screwed at every turn. Unfortunately, I don't think I don't think we will. I mean, I'd love to see it. Mm. But it's just very difficult. We, we, we didn't get it, uh, you know, 15 years ago, the Henry Tax Review, which was which well, all I really need to do is redust off that review and basically implement a lot of the, you know, basically the, the, the framework. It, it's, it was fundamentally sound, but we didn't get it there. And I doubt we'll get it now. So basically what it means, if you're a working Aussie paying income tax, you're just going to get absolutely gouged even more going forward. Uh, and Basically, the government, the federal government's going to keep piling in the people, which means that you're going to, you know, suffer from diminishing services. State governments are going to go into deeper debt uh, to, to try and fund these massive infrastructure projects that are just bloated to, to keep up with all these people. And the next big battle is water. So, you know, over the future with more people, we're going to have to somehow provide more water. Water's going to become more scarce, especially, uh, you know, in New South Wales, Victoria. And then we're going to have to build desalination plants everywhere, which is going to cost a ton of money and push up all our water bills. So, you know, just prepare. And this is at a time when we can't get skilled labour and materials have gone through the roof. But not only are they not planning it, but we can't afford it and we don't have the workforce to build it. Yeah, that's right. And, and look, you know, one of the things that irks me is people go, oh, well, if we didn't have the pandemic, our population now would be larger. Well, I don't think, well, maybe marginally larger. Mm. Problem is, though, the whole supply side of the economy was stuffed by the pandemic and we haven't been able to build homes because materials costs surged and all these other things. So the supply side hasn't kept up. The supply side has been absolutely smashed while we've still ramped the demand up to, to do this so-called catch-up immigration. And that's left us with a rental vacancy rate, the lowest on record in a rental crisis. Yeah, oh, I've never seen it like it up here. I honestly haven't. And I've, I've said many times on the show, I've got four sons and I, I say to them, I, look, I don't know how the hell you guys are ever going to do what we were able to do, which was, uh, I said this earlier in the week, you know, there was, we, I grew up in a time when you could go out, if you got a job, worked hard, then you could save, maybe you'd, you know, settle down, buy a house, work out, retire, live happily. But how do you do that now? I, it's just depressing. It is, it is, mate, and and and, and that's why your uh, opposition leader's comments were ridiculous. Yeah, you know, he's saying we're denying them opportunity if we cut back on immigration. It's like, no, no, you have denied them opportunity mm. because the the current generation, future generations are look, looking at a worse, uh, worse outlook than what you and I enjoyed and and uh, and our parents enjoyed. So the, you know, it's sort of the death of the Australian dream, I think. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, you always talk a straight. Uh, you're a straight shooter. You always talk it uh, pretty much straight from the hip. So thanks, really appreciate it, Leaf. Yeah, no worries, Bill. Any time, mate. Good to chat. Um, there we go from the unconventional economist and founder of Macro Business, Leap Van Onselen. Good